Our sermon text this morning is taken from John 6, verses 60 to 71, which is on page 892 in the Pew Bible. These words follow uh, a difficult but gracious teaching that Jesus gives in the prior section, where Jesus tells us and those who were following him at the time that he is the living bread of God who came down from heaven. And whoever feeds on this bread, which is his body, will live forever. But at first hearing, it was difficult for many people to hear. So we begin at verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the one who has the words of eternal life. And we, we believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So, Lord, as we acknowledge that we are entirely dependent upon you, as we approach your Holy Word this morning, would you be present here? Your words are spirit and they are life. So, by the power of your spirit, be present among us as we gather together as your people around your living and active word. Be present that, that you might pierce our hearts where, where they need to be pierced. Uh, that you might encourage us where we need your encouragement. Where you might calm our anxieties where we need that, that calming. Uh, Lord, be, be here with us today for we are so needy. We need you, bread of life, to feed us. And so we pray that by your mercy you would do that among us this morning. In your name, amen. <clears throat> so what would you say is the most important issue of our day? Where do you even start, right? I mean, seriously, we, we live in very, very confusing times, don't we? Uh, we, have, we have so much stuff to do, but we're more bored than we've ever been. Uh, we have more ways to be connected with people than we ever have, and yet we are lonelier than we've ever been. We are so advanced in so many different ways, and yet we've forgotten what it means to be human. We're supposed to be all about tolerance and peace and love, and yet we are constantly arguing and fighting and attacking each other, shouting at one another. And so, you know, if you're anything like me, you sort of look, look around at the world around you and you, you almost feel as though every month there's, there's a new biggest issue of our day. Doesn't it, doesn't it sort of seem like that? Like just this constant stream of issues and questions and, and problems that, that we need to deal with. What do we make, all of this, make of all of this? This confusion. Hear the words of the Apostle Peter spoken at a time that no doubt was a very, very confusing time for him and for the other apostles. Lord, 
To whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What a balm to the soul. To know that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Around 10 years ago, I, I came across this great quote uh, that really comes back to me every year around Easter time. It's from a guy named Yaroslav Pelikan, a highly decorated historian. Uh, he is, is said this uh, as he was close to dying in 2006. It goes like this. If Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. Generations come and generations go. Societies and their issues come. Societies and their issues go. We have come and we will go. But Jesus Christ remains. And the most important question of our day, the most important question for us here in this room today is really the same as it, is, it has been since the first century. Is he who he said he is, or is he not? That is the most important question, because either he is, and he has the words of eternal life, and in comparison with that, if that's true, then nothing else really matters in the grand scheme of things, does it? Or he isn't. And there is no such thing as eternal life, and everything is just passing away. So, as the Apostle Paul says, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And so we've been looking here over the past couple weeks at Calvary, at this chapter, John chapter 6, really providential that we land here on Easter Sunday. I was originally thinking of breaking away from the series on John and going to a different passage, but then when I was thinking about this text here, these words of eternal life, it's like this is, this is just perfect for resurrection morning, right? Uh, and so we've been looking at this, this chapter for the last couple of weeks. This is our third week on it, and it really tells the story of, of two days in the life of Jesus. It takes place during the feast feast of Passover, on the first day, Jesus performs this incredible sign, this incredible miracle, feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Incredible stuff. And, and everybody there seeing this happen, eating the bread, eating the fish that Jesus has multiplied among them, they, they want to take Jesus and make him their king. And then on the very next day, same crowd. Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee. They find him again, and, and they are seeking more of that bread that he fed them with, but he doesn't give it to them this day. Instead, he starts giving them heavenly bread by teaching them. He's, he's teaching them the words that are coming out of his mouth are heavenly bread. And he tells them, I am the bread of life. You need to stop seeking that earthly bread and come to me because that earthly bread that you ate yesterday, that has perished and left you hungry. I am the bread that came down from heaven that you may come and receive me and never hunger or thirst again. I am the living bread that endures to eternal life. And so, the crowd, what happens? They wind up turning on him, don't they? Because, because they, they just wanted more of that bread that he gave them yesterday. And so they rejected his teaching. And, and so in, in, in their pursuit of earthly bread, the great irony in their, in their pursuit of the earthly bread that Jesus gave them on one day, in that pursuit, they were left starved for the heavenly bread that he was offering to them on the very next day. Now, here at the end of this chapter, we find it's actually even worse than that, don't we? As many of Jesus' own disciples wind up turning away from him too. Verse 60 says, when, when many of his disciples heard the things that he was saying, they said, this, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Then... Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. 
And this should really sort of jar us, right, as people who claim the name of Christ. Because you see, these were not people who were antagonistic toward Jesus. They were not people either who were just sort of on the fence, right, and trying to figure out what they thought of him. These were people who, who made a commitment to follow him. They actually were literally following him around from place to place. That's what his disciples were. They followed Jesus. They've seen him do so many things, and yet they were offended by his teaching, and they left. Now, why were they following him in the first place? I, I imagine that they had all sorts of maybe different reasons, right? You know, they, they saw the signs that he was doing, and, and they thought that maybe, you know, if, 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 he, if they stuck with him, he would do some, some really cool stuff for them as well. You know, maybe some of them had hopes that he was going to crush the Roman Empire and bring Israel's supremacy. Maybe some of them were just sort of, you know, caught up in the, in the hype of the latest fad going, up there, going on up there in the region of Galilee. But whatever their reasons, when, when push came to shove and it became clear that, that Jesus wasn't going to be as popular as they had initially hoped, and they realized that following him was going to mean changing your thinking was going to mean denying yourself. What did they do? They turned around and they left. Why? I would suggest to you that it was because they were following Jesus not out of devotion to Jesus. They were following Jesus because of their preconceived notions about who he was and what he came to do. Right? They, they really liked you know, feeding the 5,000 Jesus. They really liked turning water into wine Jesus. But I am the bread of life Jesus, not so much. And look, you need to see that there's really nothing new under the sun. To this day, there are all sorts of different versions of Jesus Christ out there, aren't there? Right, you know, there's... Let's think about some of them. There's, there's you know, a little, little baby Christmas Jesus... Right? He's, the, he's the sentimentalized Christ. He's the one who, who gives us warm and fuzzy. I see you laughing, April. He's the one who gives us warm and fuzzy feelings and helps us give other people warm and fuzzy feelings. Now, there's Jesus meek, Jesus mild. He's the one who, who, who was really, really nice to everybody, didn't offend everybody, and he helps us be really, really nice too and not offend anybody. There's moral philosopher Jesus. Right, he's the one who can give you some, some good principles for success in life. There's what I like to call candy machine Jesus. He's the one that you sort of push the button and out comes the treat. He's just there to sort of give you uh, what you want. There's Facebook Jesus. He's the one that's just constantly arguing with everybody. Uh, <laughs> there's conservative Jesus and liberal Jesus. And no, I'm not going to say anything about either of those guys. <laughs> Right? Why all of these different versions of Jesus? It's because, right, they are all just reflections of ourselves. You see, there is a tendency deep within the human heart. It's what the Bible calls idolatry. To, to, to recreate God in our own image. And so we take whatever it is that we call God and we remake him as a reflection of who we are, our wants, our desires, our ideals, our agendas. And that's exactly the sort of thing that Jesus is militating against in this chapter, isn't it? And look, I have that same tendency too, right? I'm not preaching out, you guys. This is, this is me. This is all of our tendency, which is why I need to go back again and again to the words of Jesus Christ, the words of eternal life, not just the parts that make me feel good. St. Augustine once said that if we, if we believe, if we receive the parts of the Gospels that we like and reject the parts of the Gospels that we don't like, then it's not the Gospel we believe but ourselves. And so I need those parts that challenge me, right, that make me change my thinking so that I won't just be following like a figment of my own imagination, but I will, will be following the living Christ, the actual Jesus who speaks to us these words of eternal life because it is all about him, which is, you know, exactly what Jesus says to these people in John 6 before they leave. Look at what Jesus says to them in verses 61 through 63. He says, 
Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. In other words, what is Jesus saying? Are you offended? What if you were to discover that I really am the one that I have been saying that I am? What if I really am the Lord? What if... I really am the one who came down to you from heaven, and I am going back to heaven, which is right just another way of saying, what if you were to see me risen from the dead? Then, if that's true, then everything that I've said may be offensive, it may make you uncomfortable, it may require that you change your thinking, but none of that makes it untrue, does it? If I am, Jesus is saying, if I am the one whom I've been saying that I am, Son of God, giver of life, Savior of mankind, bread of life, judge of the world, if that is me, if I rise from the dead and prove that to you, then what? Nothing else matters, does it? And yet they still leave. But Jesus then turns to the select few there who haven't left him, and he says to them in verse 67, do you want to go away as well? I would love to be able to hear the tone in Jesus' voice as he spoke those words, do you want to go away as well? My disciples, my apostles, do you want to go away as well? Now, now, now imagine being one of these guys. Imagine being one of the 12 apostles in this moment, right? The disorientation and confusion that has taken place in your world over these last two days. Feeding the 5,000, you're actually distributing those bread and fish that Jesus is multiplying to all the people gathered there on the mountain. Then you see Jesus walking, taking a little midnight stroll out on the Sea of Galilee. And, and what would be your thinking at the end of that first day? Right? Amazing, awesome. We're going we're gonna to take the world by storm here. This, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming. We're going to take over. Then the very next day, everybody who wanted to make him their king on the previous day rejects him. Not only those people, but the people who've been traveling around with you and Jesus as well, rejects him and walks away. And now it's just you 12 and Jesus. Have you ever had experiences like that? You know, one day it just seems like everything's going great. It's clicking. You're feeling it. You know, things are awesome. The, like the very next day, everything that you, you feel like you've accomplished on the previous day just sort of comes crashing down. What do you do with that? Peter answers Jesus for us. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, here's the Bonomo paraphrase. Lord, I don't really know what in the world is going on here, but I know that you are who you say you are, and that is enough. Nothing else matters. You see, what, what is it that set Peter and the apostles apart uh, from all of the others who have left Jesus. It's this one simple thing. They just trusted him. That's it. That's what set them apart. They just trusted him. Right, P Peter quite clearly doesn't understand everything. In fact, you know, he doesn't understand really much at, at all. Right? But, but, which is why he, he, he's just like, Lord, I, I know that everybody's leaving you, but where am I going to go? I have nowhere to go. I know. I, I'm compelled to stay with you. I know who you are. I can't do anything else. For us, right, Lord, the world is confusing. Yes. I know I don't have the answers. 
Yes, there are so many things pulling at me. Yes, life doesn't make sense. Yes, I see what all the people around me are valuing. But you are the only one who can give true meaning to my life, and I want to be with you. I can do no other. You are the one who has the words of eternal life. Eternal life. By the way, what, is, what does that mean, eternal life? What does that mean? You know, usually when we talk about eternal life or we think about this thing we call eternal life, we just think about it as something that's in the future, right? Like, you know, you, you, you go to heaven when you die and then you live forever floating around up in the sky with, for some reason, there are little naked babies with wings playing harps up there. I, I don't know why they're there. Uh, but, but that's sort of how we think, right? It's just, it's just you're going to heaven when you die. It's future. You endure forever. And, uh, but it's interesting, though. It's interesting that actually three times in this chapter, Jesus speaks about eternal life as something that's present Verse 47, or verse 40, verse 47, and verse 54. He talks about eternal life as a present possession. The refrain is, the one who comes to me has eternal life. Has eternal life. Not going to have eternal life. Has eternal life. What is it then to have eternal life as a present possession? Well, later on, in John chapter 17, Jesus is going to say this. The essence of eternal life. You know what it is? This is what he says. To know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That is eternal life. To know God. What does that mean? What does it mean to know God? Oh, sure, I know God. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. Uh, he's merciful. He's imminent. He's transcendent. Right? And, and all of those things are true. And, and it's good to know those things. We should know those things. But, but, is that what it really means to know, G know God in the way that Jesus means it there in John 17? No. Think about this. What does it mean when I say that I know my wife? What does it mean when I say that I know Yvonne Bonomo? Oh, she's five foot four, green eyes, brown hair. Is that what it means? No. Right? Those things are true, and I should, I should know those things about her, right? Uh, but, but I know those same sorts of things about most of you sitting in this room right now. That's not what it means when I say, I know my wife. What does it mean that I know her? It means we share a life together. I know her in a way that I don't know any of you. I love you guys, but I don't know you guys in the same way. And, and you see, that is something like what it means to know God, to share in His life, to be in a loving relationship of fellowship with God. That is eternal life, to be one with Him. And that, you need to see, is what Jesus came to give you. He came to give you a life of sharing in God's life, to have this living relationship of ongoing communion and fellowship with God that starts in this life and reverberates throughout eternity. Starts in this life, reverberates throughout eternity. Peter is saying, Jesus, I know that if I am going to be close to God, I need to be close to you. And I don't want to just go with the crowd and leave you. I want to be with you. And here's the thing. This is why Easter is so important. Right? This is why resurrection morning, resurrection morning is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Because what it means, what Easter morning means, is that God has drawn near to us to stay. He has drawn near to us to stay. You can think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ like this. The world of humanity was lying dead on the floor in a locked house. And why were we dead on the floor? Because we killed ourselves by our own sins. We chose sin over the life of God. And so we were a body lying dead on the floor. And Jesus, the Son of God, 
is the only one who was strong enough to break into that house and revive us. And he came and he drew near to us, so near in fact, that he entered into that body, into that dead body of humanity in order to revive us from the inside. You see, the coming of Jesus Christ was like God beginning to perform cosmic CPR by, pl by placing his all-powerful hand over our cold, dead hearts and each strike to the face of Jesus Christ and each of the thorns that pressed into his brow and every pounding of each nail that drove through his flesh into the cross that took his life was like a press against our hearts to revive us and give us new life. And when Jesus Christ rose up from the dead, what happened? The heart of humanity began beating once again, but not like a beating before, an eternal beating, a heavenly beating, a beating that won't die away, that endures on and on throughout eternity so that now, now if you place your trust in him, if through faith in him you share in the life of God, you are a participant in that truth. You have that eternal life, the very life of God within you, and he will raise you from the dead because Jesus Christ is the new creation and he he takes away from you all of the effects of sin, both the effects of sin on your soul and the effects of sin on your body. That is why we believe in the resurrection of the body. That, friends, is the hope of Easter. That is what we celebrate today, and compared to that, nothing else matters. So then, where are you in this story? Two responses to the words of Jesus Christ. The response of the disciples who preferred the earthly bread and walked away, and the response of Peter and the apostles. How are you responding today to the words of Jesus Christ? Note well that I didn't say, how have you responded sometime in the past? But how are you responding today to the words of Jesus Christ? What are you doing today with Jesus? Because you see, since Christ is risen, not just was raised back 2,000 years ago, but is risen, never to die again, because of that, Easter is not really just one day a year. Easter is actually every day of your life if you know God through Jesus Christ, because every day, Jesus is risen. He is always risen. Every day is Resurrection Day for somebody who knows Jesus. And that is just an awesome thing, isn't it? You know why Easter is called Easter? It's actually, Easter is actually a, uh, it comes from an old Germanic word meaning the East. Uh, and, and the East. And that's actually a really, a really uh, appropriate name for this day because think about that, the East. Why would this day of resurrection that we celebrate today, why would it be named after the East? Because what is the East? The East is the place of the rising of the sun. And the day of Christ's resurrection is the day of the rising of the sun that never sets. That's what Easter is, the rising of the sun that never sets. The day when the light and the heat of new life dawned upon humanity in the risen Christ. The day when God said once and for all, I am with you to stay. And you see, when it comes to the rising of the sun, what is it that really matters? What is it that's really important? You know, scientifically understanding all the dynamics that are going on when the sun rises in the sky. You know, sure, that might be neat stuff to, to know and to understand. But what is that in comparison to the present reality of the, of the sun's warmth and the sun's light that enables you to see and enables you to live? 
You see, here's the beautiful thing about trusting in Jesus Christ. It puts an end to our insatiable need for certainty. It puts an end to our constant speculations. Because the light of his resurrection, it means that you can see. And the warmth of his presence means that you are safe. And the present reality of his life makes every other question trivial in comparison. Lord, to whom else shall I go? To whom else shall I go? If you are risen, nothing else really matters. If Christ is risen, then in him is eternal life. Everything else is fading away. Our stuff is fading away. Pleasure is fading away. Suffering and sorrow will end, but Jesus Christ is alive, and Jesus Christ remains. How do you know that he's alive? Look around the room. Look around the room, beloved. Dead men don't cause people to fall in love with them, do they? No, they don't. You see, this is why you need each other. You need to see the life of Christ alive in one another. In the fourth century, as I move toward closing here, in the fourth century, a guy named Athanasius, really cool guy, Athanasius, he put it this way. Listen to this. Now that the Savior works such great things among men, and day by day is invisibly persuading so great a multitude from every side to come over to his faith and to obey his teaching, will anyone still doubt whether Christ is alive? Is it like a dead man to be pricking the consciences of men so that they deny their former lives and bow before his teachings? And how, if he is no longer living and active, does he compel the adulterer to no, no, to no longer commit adultery and the murderer to no longer murder and the profane to live a pure life? This is not the work of one who is dead, but of one who is dead who lives. That's Jesus, from despised and rejected to worshipped by a countless multitude. While the false messiahs of the ancient world were long dead and buried, King Jesus was still sweeping through the Roman Empire and far beyond and even today around the world, extending his kingdom, reaching into people's hearts, bringing life to the dead. Think about all the people around the world today who are worshiping a man who was crucified. That is a miracle. That is grace. And now for those of you in this room who claim his name, what is your calling? It is to live every single day as an Easter people. Every single day as an Easter people to be the presence of his light and his warmth to the people around you because these are the days of the King. This is the day of the rising of the sun. Tis the spring of souls today. Christ hath burst his prison. And from three days sleep in death as a sun hath risen. All the winter of our sins, long and dark, is flying from his light to whom we give laud and praise undying. Amen? Amen. Beloved, the, the dark winter of your sins, believe this. The dark winter of your sins is flying away, fleeing from before the brilliant presence of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. For he and he alone has the words of eternal life. He is risen. And nothing else matters. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, thanks be to you, holy, righteous, magnificent, creator and sustainer of all that is, giver of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to working for our salvation, planning before the ages that Jesus would come and die and rise from the dead so that we might be saved in him, that we might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so we pray once again, O oh Lord, that because of this, that this 
reality would seek deep within the hearts of everybody in this room today and, and bring, bring what we need to grow into your likeness, not to keep conforming you into our image, but that you, by your grace, would conform us, your people, into your holy, righteous image. Help us to see, O oh Lord, that life is in you, and you offer that to us all abundantly in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the name and for the sake of the glory of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. For our closing song today, we, have, we do this every year, the Hallelujah Chorus.